My name is Ryan Paul. I teach history here at SUU. And I am the director of Eccles Apex. On behalf of myself and the Eccles Apex team, Sophie Javage, Faith Christensen, and Kaysen Graff, I want to welcome you to What Didn't They Teach You About Story in School? Today's partnership, or today's presentation, is done in partnership with Arts Fusion, of which we are very grateful. I would also like to thank the Eccles Foundation for their generous and continuous support of this program. Elisa Peterson, uh, Elaine Larson, and Britannia Howe and, uh, from Arts Fusion. Uh, Brianne Kramer from the Department of Teacher Education and the Provost's Office for making this event possible. I should say that I realize that comma, Brianne Kramer is not in the Provost's Office, but we thank the Provost's Office as well. But maybe someday. Yeah, right. I would like to remind you that today's conversation will continue this afternoon at 3 p.m. on Thunder 91.1 and on the Eccles Apex Radio Hour podcast. Additionally, the Southern Utah Museum of Art is hosting a Lunch and Learn today at 1 p.m. and more information on that can be found on the flyer that's on your seat. Once upon a time, there was a young boy named Kevin Cordy, who, returning from the market with three beans in his pocket and not the three shiny ducats that his mother wanted, came across a house made of gingerbread in the woods. And while the cloak and hood, red as blood that he was wearing, protected him from the elements, the smell of porridge and the three chairs that he saw through the window were too much to resist. Huh? There you go. Kevin Cordy holds a doctorate from the Ohio State University in Education, Storytelling and Storymaking, and has taught storytelling at the university and secondary level for seven years at uh, Ohio Dominican University. He taught applied storytelling as well as other courses in the areas of children and young adult literature and folk and fairy tales. He served as OSU's first academic storyteller in residence with their multicultural center. He developed programs using narrative to address gender, equity, diversity, and social justice. He now serves as a national, international storytelling consultant and is working full-time as an assistant professor of literacy and education at Ohio University Lancaster. Since 2009, he has served as co-director for the Columbus, Columbus Era Writing Project with the OSU branch of the National Writing Project. He has told stories in over 40 states, England, Scotland, Singapore, Canada, Japan, and Qatar. Kevin shares stories with a highly energetic, animated, and interactive style, and is considered by many storytelling professionals as one of the most influential and dynamic storytellers and teachers today. His award-winning story work has been commissioned by the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, the American Library Association, the National Storytelling Network, and uh, Newsweek and the Qatar Foundation International. He has authored several journal articles as well as four books, including Playing with Stories, Story Crafting for Storytellers, Writers, Teachers, and Other Imaginative Thinkers, and You Don't Know Jack, A Storyteller Goes to School. And I should note, we do have copies of both of those books for sale, and Dr. Cordy will host a book signing in the lobby today after his presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kevin Cordy to Southern Utah University and to the Eccles Apex stage. Testing. Wow, what a story, huh? <laughs> Let's see if I can compliment that. First, let me start with thank you for Ryan, for Bree, I'm sure, sure is in the audience, hey, 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 who I used to teach with, and it's an honor to see her again and just to carry this story. Uh, what, what an honor. Just take a moment and think about story and what it means to your life and what it could mean to your life. I'm going to share some comments on that. And hopefully we have time. I'm also going to tell a few stories along the line. When I was a kid, every day I would travel to a small town in Clay County, West Virginia. There I would spend time at Wavy store when my mother as a little girl would wait and hold her hand out for penny candy. Wavy always slipped extra in her bag. The old plug horses so old you were not supposed to ride them. Bob and Nail were 
waiting for her when she got there. Uncle Dude, and yeah, that was his name, would ride Bob bareback anyway, and she would walk the rest of the way. She shares her dream when she was, a, when she was little to ride in a bright yellow school bus. But that ride wasn't easy, physically or metaphorically. Out of her nine brothers and sisters, she and her brother dude would leave the holler known as Crooked Run until it met the hard road. The bus ride would take two hours there and two hours back. I'm sure many of you didn't have that journey, today at least. The bus ride would take that long. They were first picked up and last to leave. It's the two hours that they would wait. For a quarter a day, they'd work with the teacher. She'd live with the teacher, Mrs. Mr. Dallas and Mrs. Anna's house, and she would make a fire, she'd wash the dishes, she'd milk the cow. As she would say, I was Cinderella and she worked pretty hard. Her parents were dirt farmers and they got by with the way that they could. She knew he couldn't afford school, so she did her part. Some days she waved in waist deep snow for real, but she marched on. As she says it, she knew that big yellow bus was her ticket away from the hills. She wanted to get to leave and find a job in Akron. Back then, I thought this was a story. But it was so much more than that. I don't think my mom would call herself a teacher, but every day I heard a new story, saw the world in a new way, and it guided me as I stood out in the Ohio snow and saw the big yellow bus, and back then, I ran a little bit faster to catch it. You see, I was raised on stories. My mother didn't dis dissect them, give me a quiz, ask me to complete a workshop. She simply told the story. Don't I look that, like that? <laughs> and I escaped into the world she created for me. However, in school, I don't remember when we simply sat back and we told stories, except in the early years. When I was in kindergarten, I was a sixth grade reader, and instead of putting me in the standard reading group, I read on a stool this high, and I was the shortest person in the entire school district. And Mrs. Dasher would have me sit on that stool, and I would read every day to the second and third graders. I got to bring Horton Here's a Who to kids older than me, and I increased my reading so that I was reading chapters to them in, in Charlotte's Web. I loved seeing their faces when I read stories. They even made their request on what they wanted to read. I loved comic books. I know some others in here love comic books. And I was eager to know what the diabolic act of the Green Goblin was doing. When I was little, my teachers let me escape into Spidey's world, and I was able to immerse older students into the joy of the words on a different web from a different spider that wrote some pig. As I grew older, picture books became textbooks. Have you been there? <laughs> and I learned there was rules for writing and telling stories in school. Some of the rules were, you can't share the story until a rough draft is completed. Do you remember that rule? Looking for heads. You need to work at a solitary desk to be creative. Still wondering about that one. You can't talk out your ideas, you must write them down. You must, uh, you, you've heard this one. You must have a beginning, middle, and end before I can listen to what you have. What? Plot is the most important thing to a story. That's boring. You, can, you can't, and this was one that he told me time and time again, you can't write your own stories until you've read the classics of everybody else. I'm still trying to read those classics. I ask you, take a minute and examine what you were taught in school about story. Was it the same rules? How did you feel about these rules? Were you ever asked about these rules? Was story more than these rules 
than that you had. So take a moment and breathe in, everybody. You're like, this wasn't in the program. Breathe out. Breathe in one more time. An act of rest and reflection is when meaning is made. Turn to someone next to you and just say, I remember those rules, or Kevin's out to lunch, whatever, go. <laughs> And we'll only take a second for that. But I ask you, as we grew a little bit more, our parents would say, quit telling stories and get to work. Do you remember that? As we continue to grow, our teachers and later professors used lectures to communicate and tests to evaluate. Been there? Stories took a back seat to these methods. I hid my comic books, but still I searched to find out how Captain America and sometimes Bucky would save the world. Should we have to hide the need for stories? But I ask you, is this the most effective way to learn? Do we learn when we tell stories? If so, what do we learn? One thing I learned in school was to fear speaking up in class. We are told that we are brave if we speak up. How, are we, how often are we informed that we'll receive extra credit if you go first? How can we engage in telling and listening to stories if we see speaking as something to be feared? instead of valued. A Nawashi Banarji's TED Talk on stage fright equates that if we have the fear of public speaking and we don't work on it, it's, it will grow as big as a tiger. <laughs> she says over time, the fear will decrease and a hum of excitement will take its place she su suggests to make stage fright a habit. I believe there's a more productive way to view giving a speech or telling a story. Students need to talk. We need to talk in life. We need to value the rich communication of each other. Do you want to work in a place that's always quiet and you're wondering what's going on? Where the fear overcomes us where we're not allowed to learn about the big yellow busts. That if, if she didn't, if my mother didn't get on, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> I'm, as we begin to hear speaking, fear speaking more, we become quieter, <laughs> and I'm a professor, the, the teacher and the professor becomes the loudest voice. Teachers turn to lecture. With this shift, we in a real sense Learn to listen and not speak, and some research would say, be silenced. This is mirrored in college. In a 2023 Inside Higher Ed College Pulse survey of 3,004 students at 128 two-year and four-year colleges, they said it was the teacher's style that made it difficult to succeed in class. And do you know what the dominant teacher style was? Lecture. I'm not saying lectures are pointless. I'm actually doing one right now. <laughs> but the ones that stick with me include stories. I ask you, that those of you that are professors and teachers or soon to be teachers, do we need to take all the time? Or is there room for students and their stories? or even stories of their lives in the classroom. Perhaps both students and professors need to see stories in new ways. Instead of the traditional view of speaking, including stories, I take notice of the Cheyenne storytelling poet who once said to me, and his name, Lance Henson, stories are gifts. It's up to us to take them and receive them. Think about that. You're in a class, you're in a history class, you're in an anthropology class, you're in an education class. And instead of saying, who 
is brave enough to share today, you say, who has a gift that they can share? And we start teaching from that point of view. We need to think of telling stories that no less of a, a fearful action and more as a gift exchange. Writer and storyteller Rafe Martin shares that telling stories can be so much more than a fearful action. He said, quote unquote, when you're telling a story, it's like you're always in the process of rewriting. You'll never come down to a final text. The story will continue to grow and change until you die. You're changing it, and it's changing you. It's a mutual relationship. Native peoples think of stories as living things, not a bunch of words on a page or thoughts in a person's mind. They're a living being, and you kind of experience some of that when you're telling a story. A whole new way of looking at stories. This is my 34th year of teaching. Three different high schools, two states, Ohio and California, and four universities in Ohio. I must admit, I initially didn't think story is a living thing. I used story within these traditional limitations. I dare say that I called students up to my desk only when they had that rough draft. We did our work quietly. I was somewhat talkative, and so were they. But I needed to revisit the way that we see story. And it took kids to change the way I think about story. I'm not the master of classroom discipline. <laughs> I don't think I ever had a class on classroom management. But I discovered entirely by accident, when I would say six words, my students would pay more attention. And that was, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. Initially, I began to tell the stories behind literature we were reading. What was Edgar Allan Poe really like in life? Who were the people in Spoon River Anthology? Then we began having students' versions of Telltale Heart and the Canterbury Tales was now the Brunswick Tales, the schools that I was teaching at. I started to plan that story is central to my classroom. Soon our class was story-centered and a talkative class. Students came in. I remember one day when a student came up and said, oh my gosh, I'm taking British literature. Oh, it's gonna be terrible. And looked at me and said, you're the storytelling teacher. I think I'll be okay. Think about those words. You're the storytelling teacher. I think I'll be okay. I can take a risk and dive into Beowulf because you'll help me move through the story. At my second school, this time not in Ohio, but in California, I carried on teaching with stories and a young student, Jennifer Woolley, came up to see me and said, Mr. Cordy, and she had a number of classes with me. She said, you tell stories everywhere, wherever you're teaching. And I looked at Jennifer and I said, Jennifer, I stopped apologizing for that a long time ago. She said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I like stories. Can we have a storytelling club after school? I said, well, I'm not sure how that works. There's uh, just, uh, I know of one in Eugene, Oregon. Um, she said, you don't understand. Mr. Cordy, I got it handled. And we went to a dark, dank basement. And there were about five of us. And we were going to tell ghost stories for a half hour. Have you ever tried to tell ghost stories in a half hour? It was four hours. And it wasn't just ghost stories. It was children's books these 15-year-olds remembered. It was folk tales their grandparents told. It was fairy tales. And I'll never forget, I was sitting there listening to these stories, and Jennifer stood up and said, next week's assignment will be... And I learned that sometimes you have to be quiet so that students have agency and they can tell their stories. 
So I'm sitting with my students. Many of them were migrant students. The, the storytelling club is growing. We're, we're spending five to 20 hours after school just studying stories. Our name, Voices of Illusion. Don't know what happened. But, um, Voices of Illusion. And at the same time, they started meeting. And I got a phone call from the Tehachapi Wind Fair. And the Tehachapi Wind Fair is where they have all those wind currents. Okay, that thing's going crazy. No worries. <laughs> they have all the wind currents. And they said, Kevin, can you have your students tell stories based on the wind? I said, yeah, sure, not a problem. I had no idea. <laughs> my students didn't even, some of my students didn't even know we had a library. And they were in that library looking for 40 minutes for folk tales based on the wind. We went to the Tehachapi Wind Fair. The irony is the wind was so bad, no one heard a word we said. <laughs> but Voices of Illusion had started. Honestly, I spent all this time working with students five to 20 hours a week after school. We worked in the Central Valley of California in Kat Stallwell. She came in and she memorized an a LA folk singer, Ross Altman's song about Cesar Chavez. I worked where, Sh where the United Farm Workers were. I remember she sang this song to 300 people at the elementary school and the school lunch lady came out with tears in her eyes. She grabbed Kat's hand and she said, I knew this man, can we talk? And I knew that the stories were teaching them. I had a student, I tell a story called Winded Polar Bears Learn to Dance. It's about a, a little boy who sees dancing polar bears and a father who can't. And Chris could come to our meeting, but you know that one student that the, is ostracized the whole day? He was there. And I tell my students, when you come to a Voices meeting, we make everybody feel comfortable. And I told that story, and he came up to me, and he said, Mr. Cordy, can I tell that story? And I learned a long time ago, never ask why. Just let them tell the story. And like I said, it's about a little polar bear that a kid can see and a father can't because the father's not ready to see polar bears. And he told the story better than me. And then I started thinking of the why. Every time I saw Chris with, her, with his father, who was a drummer, he would be yelling at Chris. And story answers to that. I was teaching full-time as a storytelling teacher in Hanford, California. And the special needs teacher and I had an agreement. Actually, sometimes she'd bring the students and leave. I don't, I don't know if that's illegal. <laughs> But she brought four, th three students in, and I just got done saying everybody could tell a story. Everyone can tell a story. And so Lupe came in, and she has cerebral palsy, and she's completely nonverbal, followed by Jeff. Oh, sorry, Chris. Chris was blind and had memory retention problems. And then followed by Jeff Brightwell, who had a disease that he had to be restrained in the wheelchair, or he literally would eat of his body. Chris Hughes stood up and he told a story called Blind Date. <laughs> He'd never had a date in his life. Two weeks later, he had his first date. I don't know if I'm taking credit, but I just love that that happened. Loopy was an amazing artist. And like a flip book, she put her story on each a ring of her wheelchair and she spun it as the students worked with her to tell that story. Jeff Brightwell was the oldest person that survived with this disease and at 22 we lost him but I saw his mother a year later and his mother said there were two times that was the most exciting in Jeff's life. One, he met Hulk Hogan but the second, 
He played the lion and the Ashiko drum in front of 350 people, and his job was to roar. And I had every mic hooked up to him. And he would roar, and I'll be honest with you, we put extra roars in. And so, Voices of Illusion, and I started teaching with story, Jose Gonzalez. He did 50 shows with me, and I took him to his elementary school. His teachers accosted me and said, what did you do to Jose? And I said, what are you talking about? He said, he, when he came to our school, he couldn't speak at all. He had severe speech impediments, and now he's leading your group. And they had tears in their eyes as they explained the journey just to get him to talk. Today, he's, he, well, he wrote to me about how he used story in the service to help those that were fearful of the time, a terrible time. He said, I can't tell you much about it, Mr. Cordy, but I will tell you that story helped us survive. Can you think about that? Story helped us survive. So you might be thinking, it's all well and good, but all you're doing is telling stories. Aren't stories just a way to entertain little kids? To address this, I want to share with you what goes on in the brain when we listen and tell stories. I need two volunteers. I see Bree volunteering, <laughs> and I need one more. Please, come on up. And we'll see if this will work, though. <laughs> so, all I want you to do is come to this mic. You're going to watch a one-minute video, and I want you to watch it, and tell me what you see. It's that simple. And hopefully it'll start. It's already started. Okay, first name. Nancy. Nancy, just tell them what you saw. I saw this, the story of the aggressive triangle, um, and I saw that there were two that were pretty happy inside their little space, or their rectangle, and then the, uh, the smaller of the rectangle and circle, the, the, rectang the triangle came out and tried to make friends, it looked like to me, with the aggressive triangle, who was continuing to be aggressive. He, he was aggressive the whole way through. We chased him around. And, uh, and the circle, the tiny circle friend, <laughs> friend, was concerned. He was very concerned for his triangle friend that was out there with the aggressive triangle. So he waited and he watched and finally was able to get his friend to come into the rectangle with him. And they thought, okay, we're fine. You know, the aggressive triangle is out there. And then the aggressive triangle got in, and thankfully they were able to lock him in there and make their escape. Give them a hand. Nancy, right? <laughs> Bree, what did you see? That was the story of the aggressive triangle. All the friends, the relationship, all that fighting. Let's hear Bree. I learned Nancy is a better storyteller than I am. <laughs> Um, I saw two shapes fighting and trying to get back into the box, which I questioned why they were trying to get back into the box. The circle came out. Um, they started breaking up the box. I would agree with you very aggressively. Um, I wondered the entire time about their motivation. But yes, that's, I think that's how I'd summarize Give it. a hand. <laughs> and thank you. I'm going to give the answer here. 
So this was a study in 1944, and thank you again. And here's what Heimel and Semmel, when they created this, they put in triangles and squares. That's all. But out of the hundreds of people that have seen this, they created the story when the story wasn't there. For you see, our natural inclination is that we think in story. We are wired for story. The latest research within the last 10 to 20 years is that we answer, think, and respond in story. According to Lisa Cron, we're wired for story, and Jonathan Gottschall takes it a little further and calls us a storytelling animal. Let me share a little bit more about the brain. See if I can get there. William Storer says this. Now, imagine you all walked in here with this in your head. You have 86 million neurons, 400 million capillaries, 100,000 millions of axons, enough to circle the Earth four times in more than 10, 10 trillion synopses. Literally, a city is in your head. And if you show a PowerPoint, that city doesn't light up. It only lights up when you hear an emotional story. So I ask you, why are we still using the PowerPoint? <laughs> Paul Zak. Now he said that so only certain stories will have this kind of dramatic effect. So he had two different groups. One group he showed a story about a father and a son. And the other he showed about a son who was dying of cancer. And they were able to look at the brain, and any time that there was an emotional scene, the, the brain would light up again. And Paul Zak said, I would then ask the, the controlled group that had the cancer one, do you want to get the money that we're giving you or give it to charity? And 83% of the time, they could give it to charity. Paul Zak said, when you tell an emotional story, it will make the connection. This is the one that boggles my mind, though. Yuri Hassan did fMRI scans, brain scans, and he said that to, to a speaker and five volunteers, the speaker told a personal story. The listener of the emotional story brain changed to match the teller. Think about it. A powerful story can change the brain of the listener. It's a process called neurocoupling. A data chart can't do this. They've already tried it. But I literally can change your brain. So why am I doing a lecture? <laughs> there we go. Exactly. Now the storytelling, storytelling affects the brain. And the newest research is that it also affects your heart rate. Isn't this crazy? In Incel Press, a new study shows how individuals who listen to a story experience the same fluctuation in their heart rate, putting them in sync with one another. So I'm basically telling you that a story, telling a story, can change the brain and the heart. But there's so much marketing on data charts, I don't understand it. This doesn't work with all stories. Kendall Haven is a West Point oceanographer, researcher, scientist, turned professional storyteller, who wrote a book called Story Proof, and he has a thousand quantitative, qualitative studies that he looked at. And he said, and this is a sad note, that 90 to 95 percent of the stories that we tell will not stick unless it has two things. And those two things are change or resistance to change. Think about what you remember. It's not ordinary. It's when something goes a different direction. When the bride was supposed to be married but ran off with the groom's brother, I bet you the bride remembers that. So does the groom and the brother. <laughs> Social psychologist Jerome Bruner said, trouble is the engine of narrative. We don't remember the ordinary. We remember when the trouble is there. As you think on the power of story, I hope you're beginning to see that we think, act, and respond to story. 
It's just not a way to entertain. It's a way we can make meaning. But the next person I'm going to share with you challenges even this notion. He sees story as a form of technology, quite different than artificial intelligence. And the more I hear about his work, and the more I work with story, I tend to agree with him. Angus Fletcher is a professor of story science, it's a, it's a bona fide title, at The Ohio State University's Project Narrative. He not only believes that story is a technology, but he goes as far as suggesting that schools don't recognize this and that their primary way of teaching is backward thinking. <laughs> Let me explain. He states schools are grounded in teaching logical thinking, but this doesn't provide forward movement. Instead, I'm sure you probably guessed it by now, we should teach with story. He defines story as a narrative emotion, quote unquote, narrative emotional technology that helped our ancestors cope with the psychological changes posed by human biology, an invention for overcoming doubt and pain of just being us. He provides examples of how humans are different than computers. Humans make decisions by identifying a significant data point and uses them to speculate on what happens in the future. Computers make decisions by scaling all data points to see what choices give them the best success. We need to think about the power of story. Let's break this down. He suggests if we think about it and it has the ring of truth, we teach like computers operate. Computers operate on structure, right? To quote Fletcher, computers think in the eternal right and wrong in architects, and because our world has been addicted to computer thinking, we think there's absolute truths. As he puts it, if we taught structure in engineering, we would still be inventing the wheel. He suggests this is not the way life operates. Instead, life is a process of adapting and reactions because the world is constantly chasing. We must take new roles. He states structure is a myth. Instead, we need to learn to problem solve in situations that we can create and innovate. He says only in storytelling do we think we have thick structures, but we have more power than that to be creative. And in points of trouble and points when it's not ordinary, we are creative. Let me give you an example. My student was reading Jewel Parker Rhodes, Ninth Ward. It's about Katrina, and all about Katrina. And I don't like digital trailers. They're commercial advertisements for the book. There's nothing wrong with watching a 30 second, but if you want to teach teachers how to use them, you want to look at point of view. You want to look at different ways of doing it digitally. And it's about a grandmother and her daughter who's surviving Katrina. And so I'm meeting with Justine, and she says, something's not working because I'm challenging them to think beyond the text. I'm challenging them not to use the logical pattern that the, the book does. And she says, there's something missing. There's something missing. And I said, what is that, Justine? Justine. She said, the water. The water doesn't have a voice. And it doesn't in the entire book. But in her digital lesson, the water is a different color, and it says things like this. I'm sorry. I'm hurting so many people. And that's not about logical sequencing. That's about finding the story. Artificial intelligence is not going to give you that. That's why we're going to survive. <laughs> because we have story. This brings me to my method to add in our lives and in our school. For the last 12 years, I literally have adopted thinking, acting, and responding in story. Take a moment and think about your own life. Think about, are you working toward artificial intelligence? Do you spend more time on your phone trying to find data or information? Or do you call someone or talk to them and find out who those people are? So, I have them developing, I develop a narrative mindset, a deliberate practice of re refocusing so you speak with narrative intention to address an issue, topic, or belief. The goal is to work so narrative responses become a natural choice. 
Imagine if you said to someone, how was your day? And they told you how their day was. Oh, well, maybe. <laughs> But at the same time, we need to be a little more communicative. Carol Dweck introduced fixed and growth mindset and said that we can change the way we are by adapting this. In my university, in my class, we work on changing the mindset. And we have various, I tell my students for three days, I want you to adapt a narrative challenge. And they think, act, and respond in story. So one of the ways they do that is they see the story in silence. And I read beautiful accounts about what the ordinary places that they've sat and they see. They said, I saw my grandmother talking about her past and I began to understand how she lived and I never asked her before. They see the story in silence. And I challenge you, I invite you to do the narrative challenge. They listen to their own stories. I just read one of these that said, I talk a lot, but I started to realize I don't listen as much. Imagine adapting a narrative challenge. Imagine moving and thinking and acting and responding. We keep in mind change creates story. We seek story places. Some of these, I ask them to like follow a stranger and bring a friend with you so that you're not accused of stalking. <laughs> It's just all kind. This one I did as a joke, but you know how many beautiful accounts I get, not just about chasing rabbits, but where this dog went, and they met certain people where they went, and, and beautiful accounts of the dog fight and what that meant. Follow an animal for story. Literally, we're just creating space and time for story to happen. So I had one person said, I don't talk that much. You know that, Dr. Cordy. But I was in the gas station store kind of thing. And she was holding Hostess Ho-Hopes. And she turned to the person next to her. And she said, are these any good? And the person next to her was a little woman, an older woman, who said, my son loved these. And they talked for a half hour in that store. And she said, do you know, Mr. Cordy, this wasn't just an assignment. This is something I'm practicing every day. I met a friend in that gas station. I also like the ho-hos. <laughs> but I met a friend in that gas station. Do you know how many students I talk to who don't know the person that's next to them? And I say the professor didn't provide the space for that to happen. But if that doesn't happen, you need to provide the space. I come up with students that say, class and uh, will follow a stranger, listen to a speaker and storify. I have my students that say, oh, look, I went to this uh, history lesson. It didn't have to be history. It could be math. And, and it wasn't as exciting. And I said, restory it back to me. And do you know how much they hold the essence of what that is? It's amazing when they take this narrative challenge. It can change the way we respond in story. People, are, my students are like, well, how can I respond? I say, well, start using story signals. Like, this reminds me. And you know, you're talking to your mom on the phone, and, 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 you, and she says, how's your day? And it just wrote, uh, uh, uh. Just say, this, response, th this reminds me of when you were there. And considering your question, let me share what happened to me. Once something like this happened to me, I wonder, the three most powerful things that you can say to someone, I wonder, imagine, and have you considered? I wonder what you would change about your day. Imagine that your kids heard this story right now. Have you considered telling that again, but asking your dad to listen? We have a lot of power in story if we respond with a narrative mindset. Have you ever woken up and you need to believe in the story. Have you ever woken up and just said, this is a dull day? Yeah? What if you woke up and say, what story am I going to work on today? Where am I going to respond in story? I mean, it can make waiting in traffic exciting. <laughs>
even if there's no one else in the car, you can think about your stories. I hope I've shown you a little bit that story is the way that we think, act, and respond. It's the way we move and make things matter. There's a new, brand new study released last week in a book entitled Culture of Growth, How the New Science of Mindset Can Transform. And basically what this says is that they conducted numerous studies. This is a student of Carol Dweck. That you, a whole organization, a classroom, can have a growth mindset even if you don't, and you can change the group and the way it operates. I suggest this is true with narrative mindset. We recognize story as the way we think. It's how we remember ideas and that we're wired for story. It's what makes us human, and it's a technology that keeps adapting to the world. As Ira Glass from NPR shares, great stories happen to those who can tell them. And I would add, recognize when they come in the room. I remember the day that Shannon came into my classroom. I was grading papers. You've been there. And I look up, and there are 15 people there. And Shannon's holding collected diary. And there are 15 people from the Salish tradition, her tribe. And she says, Mr. Cordy, I would like you to tell my great uncle's story, Chief Dan George, who was in the film with Little Big Man and Dustin Hoffman. And I'm sitting holding the unpublished writings, the poetry, the musings, the writing of one of the big Native people in Hollywood and Native people in particular. And I said, Shannon and all the people there, this is not my story to tell. This is your story, but I will help you tell it. If I was a professor that was only using lecture, Shannon would never have had that space. She would never feel comfortable to come up with her entire tribe and family to say, listen to me. There's a saying in Zimbabwe, instead of saying hi or hello, they say, I see you. Look at someone right to you right next to you and say, I see you. Go ahead. And the other person say, you are here. Let's try it together. I see you. You are here. I see you. You are here. One more time. We're all in the class. I'll say, I see you. You say, you are here. I see you. You are here. And story makes us present. Story makes us present. I want you to think about a fish never asks why there's water. They're just in it. They just immerse themselves in the water. The same is with story. We're immersed in it. It's how we live. It's how we think. It's how we breathe. But sometimes we need to take just a moment, just a moment, to think of how we can change story to better influence the people we're around, who we are, perhaps adapt a narrative mindset, because it'll change. It'll change who we are. And frankly, as we leave today, before I tell you this story, think about the role that story in your life has. Let us create the environments where story spreads like mindset and create a narrative mindset everywhere. Change will occur one story at a time, and you are the teller who can start the change. Adapt a narrative mindset, and perhaps we may not live happily ever after, but as the Irish say, we will live with far greater understanding and perhaps better stories. I talked before about fear that we have fear of public speaking. And some of us are educators. And in some way, we're all educators in some way. We sit before people and we teach them and train them. And sometimes we're quick because our, our training is to tell people what's wrong. Maybe that doesn't move us towards story. Maybe that student begins to freeze. I'm going to tell you about one such experience where I think that maybe we should have words and language and story take off and fly. I was in fifth grade. I sat in fifth grade and I was nervous. 
I was sitting in fifth grade and Mrs. B, she said, all right, Kevin, come on up. It's your turn, Kevin, come on up. You know how to say it. You know how to say it. And at that time, I didn't know how to say it. She said, come on. I was taking my time. I knew how close it was to the front of the room, but I was trying to dodge not to get there. And she said, say the word. Everybody knows the word. Everybody knows the word. And I said, all right. I was the smallest person in the entire school district. I'm standing in front of 30 of my peers, and I have to say the word. And I don't. I say, bored. That's not it, Kevin. You know how to say bird. It's simple. It wasn't simple for me at that time. Say it, Kevin. I don't think you're trying. Bird. I couldn't say that word. I said, bored. She said, say it again. Bored. Again. In front of everybody. Time kind of went on forever. As I said 30 or 40 times, Burr, bored, 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 bored. I don't even think you're trying. Bored, 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 bored. You know how to do it. Everybody can say it. Bored, bored, bored. Come on, Kevin. Come on. You're wasting our time. Kevin, you can say it. Bored, bored. What I wanted to say. What I wanted to say is give me a chance. I'm just starting with this language. Some words are not good. I, I want to work to get the story. I want to say it, but I didn't. I was silenced, or I was silent. One of the two, sometimes they're the same. And I listened to all my students, all my peers laugh at me. Bored, 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 bored. Flashback. I'm a little older. I'm a boy scout. I'm in the middle of the field looking for snipe. Don't know what that is, but I later find out it's an elusive bird that doesn't exist. And I'm there for hours upon hours looking for a bird, and they've all left looking for the bird. Flash forward. Flash forward. I'm waking up before the crack of dawn. I'm waking up before the crack of dawn, and I'm standing there, and I'm waiting as they take the peregrine falcons, two that look exactly the same. I'm told that I gotta be really, really, really quiet. And I watched as they're released and the sun rises. Flash forward. I'm in the middle of the desert in Qatar. I am holding, I have giant gloves on. I am holding in my hand, in the middle of this desert, a million dollar falcon. I have to hold on. I look and I see its royalty. Flash forward. Storyteller Laura Sims from New York City in the crowd of 400 people yell out, Kevin, are you out there? Are you out there? This story is for you. And begins to tell this story about a, a little, little baby and an eagle that was protecting the baby. But the man, the man doesn't understand that. And he takes a crossbow. And he kills the baby. And it's the first murder. Flash forward. I'm a literacy professor. I have my students go out into the field, begin to understand what that, to work with kids. And one of my students come up to me and said, Sabrina, Sabrina, Sabrina doesn't know how to say certain words. I said, well, what do you mean? Well, she can't say bubble gum. She can't say raspberry. She can't say cotton candy. I said, well, what are you doing? How are you helping her? I have her say the words over and over and over and over and over again. And I said, well, wait a minute. Flash back. 
You, 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 I'm a little boy. I'm sitting, I'm standing in front of a classroom. I'm saying, board, 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 board. What are you doing for the student? What are, do you chunk it up? Do you cluster it? Do you, do you, do you move the words into a story? Do you, do you give them a context so that, that they can do that? And, and I'm hearing flash back, flash back. And I'm sitting and I'm hearing board, 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 board. And I'm nervous and I'm there and I can't move, board, board, but I hear the flapping of wings. I see falcons rise. I look and I see the royalty. And I tell my student, I said, you need to make the situation real. You need to make it connect. You need to move it to story. You need to make it real so she can fly just like me. Thank you again, and thank you for having such a series that really brings story to the forefront, listens to the, the diversity in speakers, and I want to just issue a challenge to you. If someone asks you, how was your day? Adrian Chambers wrote a book called Tell Me, and he says that if you ask someone, what did you have for breakfast? What did you have for breakfast? You would answer, I heard eggs and good. But if you say, tell me about your breakfast. Okay. <laughs> when you ask what or why, Adrian Chambers says, it's, they're on a defense to explain why. But if you say, tell me, tell me, what you're really saying is I am creating a space to listen to you. So we live where some people are not listened to. We need to open the door to just say, I want to hear your story. I see you, you are here. I really would love for you to take the challenge of making story make more significance in your life. Because like Carol Dweck and Fixed and Growth Mindset, narrative will spread. And there's a Croatian saying that says, you can never hurt someone once you know their story. And we are in a culture of division sometimes. I want us to come together and simply say, tell me, I'm listening, can move you miles and make significance. And that is something I'd like to see you learn in school as well as life. But my friends, that is another story for another time.